Hey, first thing I'll say is uh, I'm going racing. Just, just have to know that. After I leave here, my, my uh, two nephews and my, my twin brother have race cars, and we're going racing. So I don't normally wear race shirts, to, but I'm having a blast. Penn Can Speedway, we're going out. Two more races this year, this weekend and next weekend. So, uh, Winterization. How many of you watch Game of Thrones? You would not know it, being 70-something degrees out, but winter is coming. <laughs> so we're falling into winter. Hive and fall. Let's start with where we are right now. They are laying, especially with the weather. They're out doing their thing. Um, they should be gathering whatever propolis they need, and they're in winter mode. They're trying to seal their hives up. They've seen the taste in the last couple of weeks of some cold days. So it, in that respect, the bees are getting it. There's less forage coming in right now, less nectar availability. Uh, Bob Kloss and I have been looking at our hive scales and they were going, going, going through September. And as soon as we hit that first week of August or October, they started coming down, right? So um, you should not see pollen coming in right now. I'd be surprised if you see a lot of it. And if you sat there and watched in August, September timeframe, uh, chances are, there we go, thank you. Chances are you were seeing pollen coming in, but it's getting less and less. What you also might see, and you should not be alarmed, but if you've never seen it, it becomes very disconcerting, is there's dead bees at the entrance. So they're gonna keep the drones from coming back, or they're gonna drag the drones out, and they're also gonna get rid of some bees. This was new from Randy Oliver last uh, meeting that we had was, he said, of course, bees are altruistic, meaning if they're at the end of their life cycle or they're sick, they'll leave the hive so they don't contaminate the hive. He added a new wrinkle to that saying that if there's too many bees, some of them will go and uh, make the population smaller for the greater the colony. I had never heard of that. I don't know where the source was, but I thought that was an interesting thing. And we'll talk about what you should do, where you should go, what you should see, and, and common practices. So let's go ahead. First thing, of course, is if you have no queen, you have no colony, right? She should be laying. Because there's been a little bit of a dearth, she may not be laying full tilt. Hopefully, they got a taste of some of the goldenrod lately, and she is building her winter bees. I always think of it this way. From September 1st to Halloween, you have three cycles of bees, generally. Those are your winter bees. They're the ones that are going to change and add fat bodies and be the ones that will be there till February, right? So you do want to open your colony. This weekend, the weather is so advantageous. And check to see that your queen is laying. She may not be a ball of fire right now, but you should see some brood patterns because she's building the final set of winter bees before that first frost. If you have to requeen because your queen, your patterns stink, you're a little bit in trouble, right? Because requeening is generally a September, October is a little late. It's a September activity. You might be able to scare up a queen, but you also might want to consider uh, combining that hive with something else if you've got a bad queen. Okay, so just food for thought on that. What do you do if you find a bad pattern? This meeting is a lot later than we usually have a fall meeting, so hopefully you're not going to find yourself in trouble. You should be on track for your mites, right? July and August in New Jersey, I mean every month you should be monitoring and tracking your mites, but July and August when the flow comes down and the mites overwhelm the hive is when you do your treatments. And what you should be doing this time of year is touch-ups. Now, if your neighbors didn't do that and their hives are mite bombs and it's a warm day like today and we see some bees out operating, they're gonna go out to your neighbors and they're gonna bring those mites back because they're very opportunistic. So don't, don't sit on your hands in October if it's warm enough for them to be out foraging, they could be having a mite problem in your hive. So monitor. That's really what you should do, right? And even if you treat it, you should be monitoring until the, they get to the point where they're always on the cluster and not out seeking. And we'll talk about treatment options this time of year if you do find your thresholds are a little higher. Temperature matters. I 
I can't remember in October where it's as warm as it's been this year. It's unbelievable. We're standing here in t-shirts and it's October 15th almost, right? Um, whatever treatments you pick do depend upon the temperature and whether they work or not. Certain things need heat in order to be volatile and, and cause a reaction inside the hive for mite treatment. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is as you're treating your hives, whatever you choose can be harsh on bees and now is not a good time to be killing your bees because what are you killing? Your overwinter bees. And if you get in there and you gas your hive out on a really hot day, it's going to be 80 tomorrow, and you nuke your queen and you kill your brood, you're going to lose your winter population. So be very judicious at what you pick and what you're doing with it and be really zen with the weather on this. There is a notion to do touch-ups because certain products only work when the brood is open. And if you find cat brood and there are mites inside those cells, unless you're using mite away quick strips, you're not getting them. So some beekeepers are taking to the notion of doing an oxalic treatment. An oxalic gets phoretic mites, the mites on the bees. And if you wait long enough where the brood chambers have shut down quite a bit and you have open cells, then you can get a lot more mites. So there's more of a notion of treating earlier in the spring and getting the mites before they ramp, before flow, and making sure you have healthy bees. But some beekeepers are looking at later treatments in the year to make sure that the bees do overwinter. So touch-ups when broodless, that's kind of new emerging ideas. Yeah. Talking about oxalic, what is the regulatory? Do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I'm going to go to each of the treatments in here. I think right now, right? So oxalic is uh, there's there's two primary ways people do drips, where you take wood bleach, quote unquote, and you drip it on the bees. And the other is vaporization. You need to have the vapor vaporizer device that you buy. Before I go any further on this, I'm going to point at this. Follow the instructions and wear protection. Too many people are laissez-faire about wearing protection. With oxalic, with mite away quick strips and some of the other things, you're standing in the cloud plume, you're gonna kill yourself or get harmed, right? I'm not gonna tell you how to do these treatments. I don't do that. I tell you to go read the effing manual, right? <laughs> RTFM. <laughs> Because I want you to read it, and I will tell you that I am diligent every time I even, how many, how many have used Apigard? Quite a few. How many have used it over and over? Quite a few. How many read the instructions every time? I know how I do it. Pull the thing off, put it in the tray. No. Read it. <laughs> right? Everything you put in your hive, you want to read it and follow the instructions. Might away quick strips have to be placed a specific way. Okay? I'll put the soapbox away. Uh, on oxalic, you were, what was your question? Let me answer it now. Well, state regulations on oxalic. You can use it. Okay. I asked Tim Schuler to clarify that. It is available for us to use okay. in New Jersey. Um, there are a couple members who, who do this. Uh, I'm looking at you, Jim. And I'm about to do it tomorrow for the first time. So if you have some questions, you could probably send a note to uh, nwnjba at live.com. That's our club website, uh, club web address, and we'll get you an answer if you have questions, okay? Mighty Way Quick Strips. One of the reasons I think it's an interest is the active ingredient parses out after three days, and it's only on there X number of days. You have to consider that while it's 70 degrees today, 80 tomorrow, which is really unusual, next week it's going to be fall-like. And some of these products need heat in order to gas off and do their thing, okay? So you have to be thinking, what's going to happen with these products when it gets cold? Because you have to open your hive to get them out if that's the case. Now, mite away quick strips can be left in, and the, and the bees can remove them. You, you literally don't have to take them out. Apivar, please do not leave those strips in over winter. The instructions say how long, 42 days, and they implicitly say do not leave them in afterwards because you're breeding super mites if you do that. Don't do that. We need this product to, to stay viable, okay? 
And again, I'm not going to tell you how to use them. Go read the instructions. Kevin? Yeah. One thing I think we heard at the meeting in Sussex was with the APA bar, it's much, the efficacy is much higher if you leave it in for the 52 days or the, the, the longer Correct. time spectrum. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for making that. There is a window where you can take it out <coughs> and leave it in longer. And what Tim said is get everything you can out of those strips. Make sure you leave it in as long as possible. You'll get the best advantage of it. Why wouldn't you? The one thing I'll caution you is what is 56 days from now? It's November 25th or 42 days, right? Are you going to open your hives down to the brood chamber on the, both boxes on November 25th? It could be 30 degrees that day. You don't know. So I'm a little leery that it's uh, late for Apovar, but again, you got to do what you got to do. And, and I'll cover that right at the end about, you know, doing inspections when it's cold out. If you have the great problem of your hives are too big and they're booming, okay, figure that out, right? You want to get your honey supers off. Do not go through winter with them on. That's common sage wisdom. You want the box as small as you can get it so that they can compact and use whatever heat is available to them while they're heating the cluster. Now the hive inside in the winter time is not the same temperature as the brood, but just outside the bees they maintain an envelope of warmth and it does keep some of the hive warm and if there's heat rising up into those honey boxes that you're not using, it's not down where the bees are. So compact them as much as possible, okay? Kevin, if it's the first year of your hive, very first year, uh, do you leave it, the supers on, the honey supers? I wouldn't, unless... Yeah, I was always told that by several people. So here's what I know about honey. Have you ever seen honey in the winter? It's like a honeysuckle. It's really cold. I, I don't think it provides any advantage. And I know the bees stay warm by going inside the cells, mm -hmm. and that honey doesn't provide them any advantage. And again, I always look at... You know, we have some philosophical conversations about different uh, top bar hives and why they work. Because horizontally, the heat is always there, and they can move, and, and they're always somewhat in the heat. With a vertical box like that, the heat is in the top. Where do bees move during the wintertime? A lot of times, you see them come to the top. It might be because they're chasing the heat, right? How many bees do you need? Common wisdom for the mid-Atlantic region is two boxes, and the two boxes provides adequate resources for the number of bees and the honey stores and pollen that they need to get over winter. Dewey Karen is quoted for this saying, 30,000 bees, right? And that's six frames of bees both sides. That's how many you need. Now, if you think about that, you have a 10 frame box the cluster is six frames across, and right outside of them is typically, you know, pollen, honey, and then honey on the outside, and then you have honey in the top. I'll show you a picture of that coming up. So that makes sense, right? Two boxes. Now, I'm not one to say we can't do three deeps, right? There's a, there's a movement going on for a while where three deeps, huge cluster of bees, things like that. If that's what you're doing, then go follow that mantra and figure out how to do those hives over winter. Conventional wisdom in New Jersey is two boxes. You have a top bar? I will recommend to you that top bars should probably get wrapped. And I've heard, and I don't know why this makes any sense, but I've heard that it's more important to keep the bottom insulated. Now, when you have a top bar, and the bees only fill this much of the chamber, there's a solid board that divides occupied versus unoccupied. It's called a follower board. Move your follower board as close as you can, compact that thing, and then seal it off. Now make sure they have some ventilation, but, and then I would even recommend going as far as putting something in the empty chamber to, like insulation or, or you know, something to fill it. And, but you want to compact it as much as possible, okay? Okay, yeah, so he's got a top bar in the yard, cool. I, I am going to talk about what do you do with hives that are too small, but first I want to talk about 
this common wisdom that I just spoke about. I know this picture is a little small for everybody. Um, you see right here the way this works? Brood, 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 brood. You can, if you're that type of person, rearrange your box for fall by moving all your brood down to the bottom box in the center as that picture depicts. And then alongside of them you would put your supermarket. This is the brood pollen honey frame combination that sits on the outside. Why do you need pollen? Because pollen goes next to brood. And then the long-term storage of honey is to the outside of the bees. And what will happen is the cluster will center in the box and then as it needs it in the early days it will move left or right to the honey and then eventually as I said when they go through the winter they want to move up into the warmth they'll come up into the honey above them. So if you have other honey, which you should, where should you put it? Over top of the brood. Because the warmth coming off of the brood is going to keep that honey a little warmer and it's also going to be in better proximity to where the cluster is going to be. So this is how you arrange the bottom box and then if I above, picture right above the brood, I would take my honey and center it over top of the brood chamber. Okay. If your colony's too small, you got three options. Maybe they're just small enough that they need a little boost, you feed them. I know that says one to one, doesn't that seem weird? One to one is to feed bees to make bees one to one. You could switch to two to one, it's not going to hurt them. Two to one is for storage. Everybody got that? Why two to one? It's two parts sugar to one part water because it takes less to evaporate. When it's one to one and you're feeding them, they use the water to break pollen down and also to uh, thin out thickened honey, which is cold. This time of year they need the water. So if you're feeding bees small quantities of food, not gallon feeders, of one to one, I know I read a book where somebody took like a little tray and they slid it in the entrance and every morning they went out and slid that in and they ate it. And this is how you feed them small quantities versus two to one in a gallon poured on a gallon feeder up on the top. Okay, now when you think about this, when you're feeding them, um, I think I have this a little later, but I'll say it now. It's going to get cold at night, and if it's 50 degrees at night or 40s as it has been already, that stuff's going to get cold, and then it's not going to warm up enough for them to take it. Okay? Prop them up. You can take, if you've got a booming, booming hive, and you've got an okay hive over here, take a frame of brood out of one, bring it over, and give these guys, gals, some winter bees. Don't take the queen, okay? You could leave the bees behind too. I made a mistake, I'll admit it, I'm on camera. I had a Carniolian hive and an Italian hive and I never thought about it and I transferred some and they had a little war and everybody who was from the donation hive got ejected, right? So make sure that you're being careful about what you're mixing. Oops, I didn't even think about it, right? You can take a little resource out of one other hive and put it in another one this time of year to prop one up, equalize them. The last thing is if you got a runt and a runt, now people differ in this, I'm going to go this way. If I have a queen who's not working and a queen that's not working and I just need to get them through for what? Springtime to replace the queen. I'm not going to get a queen now. I would say take your runt and your runt and put them together. Do not try to nurse two runty hives over, you'll have two dead hives and no bees. Better to try and combine two runties and get them into one colony and hopefully they'll overwinter and then spring first thing give them a vigorous queen and they're off to the races. Now some people will tell you take that runty one and put it on a bigger hive. I don't like that idea but to each his own on how you do that. Okay and I'll tell you how to do the combination thing in a second. You had a question? Ooh, I knew that was going to come up. Yeah. See what it says there? But doesn't this mean gulp? One queen has to go? Yeah, unfortunately one has to go. Now if you want to be, I know this is a, a rationalization, a little more humane, 
You could go into one of your hives, the one that you don't want to win, and pull that queen out, and then let them have the other queen, and do something with that queen. Uh, I have taken one of those runty queens that never performed, and I put her in alcohol and I made her a queen lure. I've also taken that acrylic stuff and put her in that and encased her in acrylic and I can worship her every day sitting up on my desk, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, it kills me. To, I, I, would, I would love to put her in a nuke and just try and get her through, but, uh, you know, my heart, my heart strings, right? But yes, unfor and, and then again, you can literally put the two together and may the best queen win. Your option on how you want to go that route. Don't let your bees go hungry this time of year. Pull your frame out, take a look at it, and read the frame. If the queen's laying, there should, there should be juicy bottom underneath that egg or larva, right? Should be wet. If it's very dry, they're not getting enough of something. Feed them. I talked about on top feeder. When it gets too cold, put an internal feeder on. Usually you put that in the box next to the brood chamber so that they can keep it warm. And you slide the box over and you pour it inside. And that allows you to get some feed during colder weather. I like the top feeders and I want to be done by Halloween. I've been feeding my bees since before September because I want to be done by Halloween, right? That's the way I look at it. But when you see malnutrition, because they just don't have enough, they don't make good winter bees, and you run into problems, right? So if they need to be fed, don't be shy about it. Two to one for internal feeders. You could also start considering hard formats if it gets too cold, make fondant make hard candy. You shouldn't do this though. I mean, ideally you're gonna have your bees by Halloween buttoned up, 60 pounds of honey ready to go, and hard candy and hard feeding and just pouring sugar on the lid is emergency only, okay? Again, the rule of thumb is a lot of food for storage, two to one, small amounts for food for feeding bees. I talked about equalizing, take brood frames, no adults or bees, queens from large colonies and put them in. This is how you do a week with a strong or a week with a week, right? Two runties. Take the one hive that's on the bottom board, smoke it, put a thin piece of one, one layer piece of newspaper over top of it, smoke the second hive and put them together. The smoke prevents them from getting all fussy and hopefully in time they'll just chew through that paper and they'll become one when they join each other. Okay, Not a complicated thing to do. Um, if you want to help them out you could slit the newspaper right? and then once you get the stack together and you put the roof on just smoke the whole colony through and um, you know what that does is if there is scent coming off both queens you're kind of masking it and hopefully they'll, they'll know right away that they're together. They can tell, okay? And again, by the way, this should have been done back in September so that they could have time to merge, grow, do the thing that they're supposed to, but they're better than dead hives, right? 60 pounds of honey. You all understand that if I grab a hive and I pull up on that handle, and once I get to the point where I'm carrying the weight, I should go, uh, I should not go, oh, right? That motion really is a, a tr that's a beekeeper motion. You all do that, right? Uh. <laughs> you should go, uh, if you don't, it's not heavy enough. Feed them, all right? And what we talked about is honey in the outside frames, honey ideally over top of the brood, okay? Rule of thumb is each capped honey frame is 10 pounds. If I take a full deep out, actually I think it's 11, but if I take a full deep and it's capped on both sides, it should weigh about 11 pounds. If I need 60 pounds, how many do I need? About six of them, somewhere in the hog, okay? So now I've given you how many are in from a honey and how many for bees, six and six, right? And then the rest is miscellaneous storage. Now what you want is 60 pounds and they'll draw that down to about 20 pounds by spring and they always want to have about 20 pounds reserve, right? So they'll consume 
somewhere in the area of 40 pounds over the winter time, if they're going to go to town that way. Um, how do you arrange a top bar, for those of you who are interested in that? Bees go on one end and honey goes on the other, and pollen goes in the middle. Remember, the same, same format, but one way, this way. You do want to put the bees closer to the entrance sign, though. Simple stuff. Checklist. Close your screen bottom boards. Don't forget. And by the way, don't do what I did, which is reach under to feel if it's a screen bottom board and there was a bee there and stung me on the finger, right? Bend over, take a look. I don't remember always, I have solid end bottom and end screened and I got stung on the finger. So if you have some bad equipment, seal it. Some people literally take the blue tape and tape all the seams. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's really not a bad idea. Use uh, real blue tape, not the cheap stuff, so it won't peel your paint off. Um, do you put your entrance reducers on. Our cats have been bringing mice to the driveway for the last three weeks. There's mice all over and voles and so on. They're out, so they're getting in your hives right now. Don't put an entrance reducer on and trap a mouse inside. Make sure you look before you put it in, all right? Some people put quilt boxes, homosote. You cut a piece of homosote the same size and you put it on. The point of that is the moisture comes up, gets absorbed by the homosote, and then the open edges of the homosote material give the moisture out. Lanny Simone uses that all the time for moisture control. And I'll say it, you've heard it over and over again if you've been around, moisture kills bees, not the cold. So you have to make sure that you control moisture in your hives, okay? You want upper ventilation. And as we say all the time, ventilation, you don't create a chimney effect. If you're going to ventilate, ventilate to the front of the hive. If you have it in the back, air comes in and goes out this way, it sucks hot air out. But if you have it in the front, they say it does not do that. I don't know thermodynamics, but don't put your entrance stuff in the back, okay? Uh, Jim knows thermodynamics. Jim does, so yeah. Is that the right advice? <coughs> okay, Jim's not going to go there. Because we'll never get to the food. Yeah. <laughs> so obviously you want to put something on your lid, strap them down, do whatever. You do not want to be going out when it's snowing, you know, trying to figure out whether your hives are safe. Do it before you get there. This is a time of year where you want to look at your apiary. Is, are your hives in the right place? If when they cluster you have the chance to move them, make your plans to move them before snow sets in or before they freeze to the ground or do whatever. Put them in full sun if you can. Three feet or three miles, you know the adage if you're going to move them. Um, if you have wet areas or you have soft ground and your hives got really heavy and they sunk and they've got a little bit of a list to them, now's the time to get them fixed, get them level, and get them leaning forward a little bit, right? And the purpose of that is if it rains on the bottom board, if they're leaning back, the water comes back and then forms ice on the bottom board. So lean forward so that they drain out, not backwards, okay? Um, vegetation. It's been really dry for, for whatever reason and a lot of the stuff is dead, but get rid of that, right? Because it allows mice to be hiding and I got this from uh, Honey Bee Sweet, one of my favorite websites. Um, she had a checklist and that was one of the ones that I picked up is it, it provides a, a convenient critter place. And I'm guilty of this. My hives in one set sit right next to a cornfield and I went out <laughs> finally with a weed whacker and cut everything down, but it looked like a jungle there for a little bit, right? Um, covered the rest. There is a school of thought about wrapping and insulating. I'm not going to go into it. It's not necessary, but it's also not a bad idea. If you want to know about this, we had John Gott in and did a presentation. Why insulate hives in northern New Jersey? Go look that up on the internet. Amazing resource. Research is great. And that's his hive, actually, one of the many that he has right here. And he has analytics, measurements that he's taken about how strong his hives are and so on from him taking this action. And of course you could do tar paper, which is what, what's here. Cheap, simple, staple it on. Um, the other thing you could do is windbreaks. 
I know the picture is small because of the way we have the projector set up, but they have hay bales set all the way around. Don't do that. I just talked about creating a jungle where things could hide. I'm sure that's a mouse haven, yeah. right? Set them out wider. I know one of our beekeepers for Northwest, I went to her home. She has a post in front of every one of her hives, like a street sign post. And she has a panel like this big and this high. And it's that soft corrugated plastic material. And she has it leaned and she drilled a hole in it and she has it zip tied. And it sits like this in front of her hive as a windbreak. You know what else happens? When the sun hits that, it creates heat. And if you step behind that, you could physically feel the heat from that thing. It was really cool. Keeps her hives warm in the winter. It was like that clear smoke color. It was clear, Does but it. Uh, no, you know, it's you see them on sheds sometimes that that rippled roof that. But it's plastic. It's plastic. It's soft, pliable plastic. I'm sure when it gets colder, it's not as pliable. But, but she just had a piece of that. Janice Sue's office, who I'm talking about, she had a piece of that sitting up in front of her hive. So I thought that was really brilliant. If I only had the time to do all that stuff. <laughs> Up here, and wherever you may be, because bears are everywhere in New Jersey, now's the time they're on the move looking for their winter, and they're feeding. Um, one of our members last week, two weeks ago, just got hit in Warren County. And Bob Kloss went up and helped put his hives all back together. Now the bear apparently was transient and passing through, but bear fence in his future, okay? So consider where your hives are. Do think about where you have your hives placed. Um, if you're along a tree line somewhere near a creek and so on, I'll, I'll give you a for instance, and I'm sure Becky could probably talk about this. The bears come down the Delaware River and then they follow the streams up into Stockton, follow the canyons and whatever. They love that territory. So if you live in that area, you're more susceptible than if you're out in the middle of a cornfield somewhere. If you do have fences, make sure you're diligent about it. Keep the, the weeds cut, cut the, cut the um, stuff down so your, your grounding is working properly and keep them baited all the time because you want them to get a taste of that fence. And they're probably testing it anyway. Oh, uh, yellow jackets. That's a, the bane of our existence right now when it's warm because they didn't die yet, and there's nothing for them to eat. So they're opportunistic. We've, I'm gonna be squeamish about this, we had snakes. So yesterday, Sharon and I were walking, there was a dead sunny fish sitting in the middle of the road. <laughs> I think a blue heron picked it up and dropped it, and it's literally sitting on the yellow line. You'll see the uh, yellow jackets eating that because they're meat eaters, but when they can't find something to eat, they'll be eating your hive. And they're extremely aggressive. And as soon as they start picking, they're relentless. Last year was terrible. And given it's warm, it could be that way again. So you see what the strategy here is. Put an entrance guard on. And then the, I like that entrance guard with the little holes. And then I take blue tape. And I tape it right to the smallest thing. And what's cool about that is depending on how strong the hive is, they'll open the holes as they need it. Or they'll leave them closed if they're good with it. So blue tape is perfect for that because they can Same control the entrance. Shut except for a couple openings. I, I tape it closed except for four holes. And then they adjust. And then what's neat is I don't even have to do anything. In the springtime when, when you know April hits, they start eating through the holes and they open it back up. And then you just peel it off when the, when the flow is on. Isn't that so sticky? I mean, do they get stuck on them? Mm -hmm. they, they don't because what happens is that glue gets cold on the other side in the cold and it's not as sticky that way. I put it literally over and the sticky is inside the hive, but I've never seen any bees ever stuck to it. And I know that touching that stuff, it's less sticky when it gets cold. Now, this is a really important concept. That's a simple robber guard. It's two pieces of wood with a screen attached to it and then two to give it rigidity. And the bees have to come to the hive and go down and in. How does a robber come to a hive? It comes, it looks at the entrance, and it darts right through past the guards. It can't do that with that setup. And then, called? I'm sorry? What is that called? It's a robber guard, or a robber screen is what they're commonly referred to. 
Four pieces of wood and a little piece of screen, that's it. Now the house bees figure out when they get out that they have to come out and go over. So when they come back, they go right back in. They figure that out, no problem. But the, but the robbers never get it. And you'll see robbers flying and, and they, they can't figure out how to get in. Yeah? When would you take the robber screens off so the bees can clean out? The yeah, I mean, when it gets cold and they're on the cluster all the time, then you can take them off. But I, I would tell you right now, I would even put them up prophylactically. We've had that discussion um, because we've lost hives up at the mentoring yards where you can't, you know, how, how many of you work every day? I, I can't be out there to tell, so it's a good insurance to have them. And then when it's cold where they're in the hive and they're not, then you can take it off. When it gets cold to the first frost is properly the right answer. Then the yellow jackets die, the queens go into ground, and they do their thing for winter until they emerge. And so it's as long as you see yellow jackets flying around, I would have that. Now, if you do have an, a hive being accosted, this little shim that he cut just slides down in and closes the hive off. And it's ventilated still, right, because it's got screens, so it's not really going to cause a problem. Um, if you go to the gadget garage thing that I showed you earlier on our website, there's a feature there, I think, for that. Or Bob Kloss has them. I don't know where he got that design. So I'll have to do a to-do on that because I think that's really important. Okay. I think you should be monitoring your hives, but it really is typical of this time of year that they have everything sealed up and I want you to think about propolis when it's hot and soft and you take the hive apart and put it back together it all melts but you take it apart now and it goes and it doesn't go back together as well right it's cold so every time you crack that hive open you're breaking the seal that they worked all winter to or all fall to come right other thing is if you pull a frame out and it's 50 degrees, it only takes a moment for that brood to be chilled. You could damage all the brood. So if you're doing inspections this time of year, my father used to say, state your business and get off the phone, right? Know what you're going in for, pull that frame out, get it done and put it away. And if you could avoid it, you should be done with all your manipulations by October 31st. And you should have no need to be in your hives at this point. Put them to bed, read them a little story, and let them go, okay? If, if however, your bees are going to die, if you don't do something, do something. Intervene. Say that every year. If your bees are going to die, open them in the cold is not going to make them any worse, okay? Do whatever you can to get them through. What about snow? You're going to see some things in the snow if you've never experienced this. You'll go out on a snowy day. Sun will be shining. Hive will be warm on the front because the sun's hitting it. You'll see bees on the front warming themselves up to go out for a cleansing flight. And you're going to see drops of fecal material on the snow. This is normal. If you see a bee landing on the snow, don't panic. Oh my God, it's not going to make it. It'll be okay. It flies back. They know how long they can or can't be out. But it is normal to see uh, fecal material on the snow. Now, it's there all the time when you get warm days. You just never see it. But when it snows, you see it, OK? This hive picture, you could see clearly there's upper entrances. He also has a quilt board. I want you to notice something about that hive. What do you see? There's snow on it. Why? Because he has insulated covers and the heat is not leaking out and melting the snow. I did an experiment where I put it insulated on one and not on the other and went out with the snow like that and one had snow insulated, one did not. So I really believe in these. Um, he keeps an upper entrance. Now this snow is not deep enough to cover the bottom. But do you have to go out and clean your hives off? Make sure the entrances are open when it snows? It makes you feel good. Usually enough heat comes that eventually it will clean itself off. I think it's probably a good idea. Look, it just feels good, right? But yes, Charlie. Yeah, go on, finish your thought. I'm going to finish up. I got an idea about something that's important. Yeah, if you have an upper entrance, though, you, you obviously don't have to worry about it. That, that's really where I was driving. 
I always, just because I like to go out and take photos, um, I always go out and clean the entrance off while I'm out there anyway, right? Yeah, go ahead, Charlie. Sorry. One of the things about this upper entrance business is very important is ventilation. And then where the air is coming in is at the bottom. Now, if you don't think that these entrance reducers are important, the bees do. Because what the bees will be doing inside that lower entrance is busy. They'll make a propolis close off. All right? So I had a bright idea one year. I went, oh, maybe if I put some entrance reducers in, that'll help them stay warmer or something. Well, I put an entrance reducer on the front. That entrance reducer plus the propolis stuff entrance equaled a cutoff air supply for the hive. And I almost killed the hive just like that. So what you got to do while he said to put the entrance reducers on to prevent the mice, put them on now so that'll stop the bees from gumming up the bottom board for you. And then, the, then the upper one is important too because that lets the moisture out. At minimum, I hope everybody has something under the inner cover, a twig, a rock, a stone, or something that lets it open up a little bit so that air flows out. You really don't want that tight top cover. A lot of the inner covers come with a notch up on the front. Some people tape that off. I would leave it open. You want to have something that allows ventilation in the wintertime up and out of the hive. You don't want condensation hitting, freezing on the top or getting cold and dripping back on the bees. You want that moisture to be leaving the hive. Okay? So an upper entrance does provide that uh, way of doing ventilation, especially if you have um, quilt boards and things like that. Now again, I talked about the homosote, that's another option, right? That wicks the moisture into the material and then it sends it out through the edges. And that's it. I'll, I'll take whatever questions you have um, or anything I missed. Yeah. you have your hive like 18 inches off the ground? Uh, yeah, I mean, I hope everybody does that, right? You don't want it down on the ground where it's wet. You always should, it doesn't matter whether it's winter, summer or whatever, it should be up. I know people put things on cinder blocks. I like little air movement, but if you're in an area which has a lot of wind, you do want to put some sort of barrier so the wind is not blowing through under the hive. I've heard, if you read even back to the hive and the honeybee, the design that they had did account for movement of air underneath the hive, but too much movement I've heard is not good for that, right? And if you're in a really windy area, you want to stop that wind from flowing through your hive and drawing the heat off of it. So yes, good point, get it up off the ground. Had a question in the back? Yeah, I, I have a couple of hives. One was a really late season swarm, which landed on my neighbor's front yard. And then I got back into a, into a brood box. Probably has about half, uh, it's a 10 frame box, it's probably about half drawn out. I have an internal feeder in there. I have another hive at a different um, site, that top box full of bees, full of food, bottom box has no brood, no bees, no anything in it. I'm worried a little bit about the late season swarm, and maybe this other box. Any thoughts on, you know, possibly combining their, you know, have nice brood patterns? Yeah, so, so let's talk about Let's go, so your, your comment first was the one box was a late swarm. Hey, you know, the, the saying about, uh, you know, late swarms. Um, I figured it was worth a shot. I, I'm the one that just said about how I coddle my queens, right? So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would take that and put it in a nuke, yeah. and then I would wrap it in insulation or nestle it up next to a full-size colony if you can and let them share the warmth through the wall and see if you can get it through that way, but I would not leave it in a big box if they don't occupy the whole box. So if you have something that's, a, I think you're gonna need five frames, honestly, to get through of bees yeah. and resources. They probably have five to six. Yeah, so if you have that, then chances are you might be able to consolidate that down to a nuke, and you can overwinter a nuke in New Jersey. You have a better chance, so I'll make a recommendation that buy a nuke uh, migratory cover, if you've seen these in the catalog, instead of a full telescoping cover that goes over the sides, they're flat on the side and they'll let you literally put that nuke against another colony and they can share the heat through the wall. 
right? And we took uh, FLIR cameras and shot pictures of hives nestled and you could see literally they're joined at the wall. On the other hive, that sounds like a runty hive. Uh, maybe you make a candidate for joining or I'll give one other option that I didn't talk. It's probably a little more advanced for this discussion is you can put a screen board all over a full colony and put a single deep over top and let them share the warmth. Problem is, is if that's a crappy box and it dies, then you have that situation I said where you have too big of a thing. So you'll want to monitor them. But there are options for really simple screen boards that let you put a hive on top of a hive. And maybe you consider that option if you don't want to combine it or do whatever. You're, you're a little late to try and do something to uh, get that hive to fill out two boxes this time. It's just not going to happen, especially if they need to draw comb. That's, that's not going to happen this time of year. Yeah, they just, they just haven't really utilized the bottom box. It's drawn. It just so you might also think about moving them down like that picture that we showed and leaving a little bit of the brood right above them. But my concern with doing manipulations like that is if you have a small amount of bees in that top box and it gets cold, you're, you're basically condemning them to a lot of work and possibly decline, right? So, um, you go you know, again, I, I, you can, if you can overwinter a nuke in the way that I said, you can overwinter a single box too, so you might consider that option. And if you want to talk more, we'll... Okay, yeah. Listen, Polly, what you said about the blanket that draws the moisture on yeah, the what is that? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. So, a lot of the, the material that I talked about is homosote. It's ground up uh, wood pulp like sawdust mixed with glue, and then they make boards out of it. You see it a lot of times in floors in homes. It's cheap. Chipboard, different, different. Chipboard is literally like chunks. This is sawdust format. I'll send you a link to Homosote or look it up. H-O-M-A-S-O-T-E is the name of it. But picture if I took a cup of sawdust poured it into a mold to the shape of a two by or a plywood panel and poured glue in it and had that. That's what it is. And if you've ever left this stuff outside, it goes from regular dimension of plywood to because it absorbs water. That's why we use it for that. If you put it over a hive, it absorbs water. But one of the things it does is the edges are less sealed than the face. So if you put it on a hive, it wicks the moisture into the board, but it gives it out more freely out of the edges. And what they do is they take a box and they put it on top and then they put the cover on and then they put the inner cover over it and that edge is exposed all the way around and the moisture comes up, gets sucked into the board and then it dissipates out through the edges of the board. That's what a quote board or a, a homosote board is for. Does that make sense? So it goes next to the bees, then the It goes right on top of the, the second brood box and under the inner cover. Yeah. Yeah, but people cut the center hole and let the air pass through. Yes. I don't use them. I know Lanny Simone swears by them and I know several other beekeepers. Stan says he has them for sale in the store. Yeah. It has a hole in the middle, right? Stand like a, a channel. Yeah. yeah. There's a channel today He said they have a channel in them. <coughs> so I have similar to what Bob had, those quilt boards with a foam insulation inside it. That's what I use, so I don't use those. I don't have much experience, but I know that people do. Is this good to use with an insulated outer cover like Bob does? The sort of pink uh, rigid uh, Insulation. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is where John Gott talks about the different layers, right, that you can use and, and uh, the insulation of maintaining. I, I don't have any practical experience, so I don't want to speculate on that, but I can't imagine it would hurt, right? Because one would wick the moisture out and the other would prevent the heat from passing out. So I think they probably could work in combination. Yeah. I, I'm here all day. If you have any other questions that you think of, or just jot a note off to that email address. But um, about pollen patties? yeah, you know that there is conversation about feeding 
sugar almost always in winter, but nobody talks about pollen patties. If you are going to put a pollen patty in the hive, which is not a terrible idea, put it between the boxes on top of the frames. It has to be by the brood chamber, otherwise they're not going to do it. Some people do put them in the top and you get warm days where they come up and they take sugar or candy board and they eat the pollen. But if you really want to be effective, put it in between the boxes. And I don't know why beekeepers don't talk about this as much, but feeding pollen is um, not a practice that, that is very common, but probably could be more so, right? Yeah. The, this time of the year, pollen is very efficacious right now. It's a good thing to do because what are the bees going to fatten up on? There's, you got new bees hatching out for the winter, and what do they need? They need a ton of pollen. They need pollen, right. So now is the time to do it, but then after they fatten up, and once they cluster up, they've got vitalogenin stores, their fatness, and that's what they're evolved to live on. You leave that in there, it's not going to be any good. So there. I, I always look at, uh, what's really funny to me is, if I do go out, uh, case in point, we were off obviously for Christmas. Christmas Day last year was 60 something degrees, everybody remember that? And I was out there watching, and they were bringing back pollen. Yeah. Crusty old, who knows where they got it, pollen. But they were bringing back pollen, and somebody was building bees. And it amazes me that at any given point in New Jersey, they can find pollen. I don't know why. So I have not made it a practice of feeding pollen. But when I see Tim Schuler feeding pollen in the spring to give his bees, and I see he has a barrel, and he pours the, the pollen mix in it, and the bees are just going berserk. And I could tell you, Jim has sawdust that he pours outside of his wood shop, and they're seeking all that sawdust early in the spring. So I think it's more of a spring advantageous, but I, it certainly can't hurt, is my thought on it. I heard that, um, I heard that the bees, the, like the custodian bees, carry out the pollen. They lick off the um, sugar syrup from it, but they carry out the pollen because they think it's trash. Yeah. yeah. We heard that a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you know, there's, there's all this conversation about uh, the, the effectiveness of pollen substitutes and how good a quality they are. And really what they are is sugar patties with pollen mixed in. But even sugar, you'll put dry sugar in and if the bees don't need it or don't want it, they'll drag it out like you'll find sugar out there, right? So some people for good measure take a five pound bag of sugar and before they put that final on, they'll pour it around and close the hive and then you'll see that stuff is taken out by the bees or sometimes they use it. They don't have the water to process it so they might see it as refuse. So yeah, you're right. So, good. Thanks everybody. Thank you.